the uh, formal part of the class will start at about five past nine, but I'll just start with some introductory remarks. First of all, um, I've got bios from a large number of people. I haven't done a count yet to see from whom I haven't gotten them, but if you haven't sent me a short bio, please do. Uh, it just helps us to get to know who you are. Um, let's see, second thing, uh, the next deliverable, which is I think in a week or so, I don't have the syllabus with me right now, uh, we'd like a preliminary indication from from you of, uh, I'm leaving, leaving it up to you to form your own teams. Roughly, we've, we've found about about four people make up a, a good team. That's a, that's a good way to spread the, the work around. If any of you are, are having difficulty or whatever, let me know. We'll, we'll try to help, but you know, you're all most, almost all graduate students. You can, you can organize yourself. Um, with a preliminary indication of what system you would like to, uh, to do a study on. Should I take a handout? Um, second thing, uh, the, yeah. I'm just wondering if you could provide a list of email addresses to everyone so that we can contact each other about. I will be happy to do that. I'll post that. Um, let's see. Uh, the second thing, there's a there's a fair number of listeners in the class, um, and quite a few of you have contacted me to make sure that it's okay to be here as listeners. I have no uh, problem with that. The only thing that I would ask, you know, right now we're more or less filled to capacity as long as it remains, you know, I expect that, that the class isn't going to grow after this, so I think we're okay. What I did tell people is that if we get into a seat crunch, obviously the people who are taking the course for credit have priorities for seats, so any of you who are listeners, uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, next thing. Um, I'm going to be putting some things on reserve in the library. Uh, this is courtesy of Professor Cohen. This is uh, the proceedings of a space shuttle technical conference. Um, Aaron, do you want to say something just about the background? What the background is that uh, uh, we decided after the shuttle fl uh, had flown a couple of times that we would have a typical NACA, going back to the NACA, uh, but this was NASA technical conference where we actually had technical papers written by the various people that designed the system. Some of you will hear talk, some of you won't, but these are technical papers of how the systems were developed. So it's a pretty detailed understanding of the thermal protection system, the main propulsion system, so forth and so on. So it's a pretty good documentary of how it was and done. So this, this should be a, you know, a, a good uh, reference for, for your papers. It's uh, 1983. Um, so, like I say, I will go down this afternoon and put this on reserve in the library. I will also put on reserve uh, a copy of a system study that was uh, that was done at Texas A&M for a similar course that Professor taught on systems engineering in the space shuttle, just to give you kind of an idea of uh, of what someone else did. This this was a rather good paper. I see you you gave them a very high mark, so. It's uh, presumably that means it's a it's a good example. Um, finally, you've all got a, a copy of uh, this uh, paper by Professor Cohn and uh, and Milt Silvera, who uh, who was also a, a very responsible person in the shuttle program. It's a it's a high level uh, background on the shuttle and its systems. Uh, I'm sure there's there are some of you here who are space enthusiasts and who probably have followed the shuttle system pretty closely and and to whom there won't be a whole lot new here but on the other hand um, you know we want everybody in the course to come up to a, a certain level of knowledge about the shuttle its uh, systems and the systems engineering that went behind it so uh, I think it's it's good to have something like this available it's a, it's a nice reference piece uh, okay the next uh, today and Thursday um, Professor Cohen is going to give an introduction into the
the shuttle, its systems, and the system engineering that went into it. Uh, before we start that, are there any any other questions, uh, either about the technicalities of the course or just anything that? Oh, I know one thing. I had a few comments from people telling me that the PDF files, which I posted on the website, some people could read them, some people could not read them. Um, I've been posting. I, I have Macs, but I've been posting PDF files for numerous courses. I've never had any problem with people reading it before. How many people had, did anybody, uh, well, ha have, if you've tried, first of all, who has tried to look at the files? Okay, of those people who have tried to look at the files, who has had difficulty? This is strange. Um, Maybe, um, well, if anybody has any ideas about what the problem might be, I'd, I'd be very curious to, uh, I mean, have, have you ever had this problem with other courses on, on uh, um, I, I will uh, do a couple of experiments and, and post one or two more uh, documents, uh, both in PDF and in uh, either Word or PowerPoint form. Um, I'd suggest that everybody during the next two days uh, go and try to open them and let's, let's see if we can isolate where the problem might be. Like I said, I've never had this problem with any other courses and in principle, I mean, the whole point of PDF files, it's supposed to be compatible across uh, Macs and PCs and all that. So I don't know what the problem is, but we'll see if we can run it down. And I thanks to those of you who let me know that, that there was a difficulty. Um, that's all I have. Any, any other questions, comments? Yeah? Um, what are you kind of expecting with this journal, these journal uh, deliverables? Um, just so we can kind of be thinking ahead of that. Um, the idea is, is to, uh, you know, basically take, uh, put together the, the highlights of the lecture from a systems engineering point of view. In other words, what, what we want, and when, when somebody is talking about a specific system, uh, we want you to uh, have, a, you know, a brief description of the system, the purpose, what it, what it does, uh, something about uh, the design considerations, um, something about the uh, the operations kind of the the basic uh, concerns that from a systems engineering point of view and you know anything they talk about particular interactions between that system and other systems can you you think of anything else in, in particular I think that's about okay um, I'll, I'll think that through a little bit more and maybe maybe I can come up with a checklist that would that would help you uh, put that together uh, it's not meant to be a big burden it's just a, a way to organize everybody's uh, thinking on uh, how to get the most out of out of the lectures, particularly because you know, as, as I mentioned, these lectures will—they're all being given uh, by and large by different people. Um, you know, they'll have different styles. Um, we've kind of explained to everybody the structure of the course, what we're looking for, but I can't really guarantee in advance what the content of the lecture will be. Um, Professor Cohen and I will, will make any attempt if, if the lectures don't cover some of those critical points from a systems engineering point of view, we'll try to uh, stimulate the discussion on that or, or fill in, but you should uh, you should do the same thing. In other words, make, make sure that uh, if there's something that you think you would like to be getting out of the lecture, and and you haven't gotten you know don't don't be embarrassed to ask questions. I think uh, something you ought to think about when these individual lectures come up is should be the description and function of the system. If they don't bring that out, then we ought to try to bring it out. Uh, the requirements of the uh, the subsystem of the system. What are the requirements? Because that's very fundamental. What are the requirements? The development of the subsystem. What kind of problems do they have? What, what kind of uh, technologies do they have to overcome? And of course the operation of the subsystem. So those are. So I think key points. Now, whether you're going to get that from everybody or not, I don't know. But I think uh, you need to look for that. And if you don't, then we'll try to develop that. Yeah. Are you looking for just the notes to take in class? Or 
I, I don't follow you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for a Xerox of what you're writing in the notebook, if that's what you mean. No, I mean, I'd like, I'd like you to put your thoughts together into a concise, concise form. Uh, and, and I think that will be a, you know, a good, good reference for you, hopefully, after the course on, on shuttle systems. Okay. Over to you. Um, you're going to have a, a very uh, unique opportunity. You're going to have uh, people speak, lecture you on the various shuttle subsystems in quite a bit of detail. You'll have some people that will be very, very positive about the shuttle, that think it's a great design, a great operation. You'll have others that will not think it's so good. And you'll have some that will give you just a technical, a detailed technical approach of what happened. I think what I would like to suggest to you, for I think for your good and for the good of uh, the future, future students, future designers, that you ought to come up with your own decision. Was it the right, well, was it the right design? Was it the correct design? Uh, should it have been done differently? And if so, why and how would you do it? And uh, I think that'll be good for you after you get to work on future, when you go to work on future projects. It'll also be good, I think, for NASA, something we could turn over to NASA. So I think it's a very valuable uh, thing to do. So I would suggest you do that as you go through the, as you go through the course. And I will be happy, very happy, to talk to you about any of your ideas that you have uh, through, the, through the internet, through emails, or in personal discussions. So, and you might want to do this later on as the semester develops. Um, a little bit what I'm going to say today really starts off from where Dale Myers, your previous speaker, left off. And it gets in a little bit more detail. So it's going to, as this course develops, you're going to get more and more and more detail. But let me start off again, just very much like Dale did, uh, and talk about the shuttle history. Um, in 1952, fully reusable launch vehicles, uh, the concept was discussed. People were interested in that. 1962, fully reusable vehicles were ser seriously considered. The Air Force studied Project Dinosaur, which was canceled in 1969. In 1969, NASA adopted the idea of a fully reusable spaceship. Um, I became the Orbiter Project Manager for, for uh, NASA in August of 1972. And at that time, I also was uh, manager of the Systems Engineering Organization for the first two years. So I had the total, you might say, the total system at that time and the Orbiter in 1972. Uh, yes? Could you tell us a little bit about your background, the country of that position? Well, <laughs> my background was that, uh, yes, uh, I started off at uh, I graduated from uh, Texas A&M University in 1952 and went to the Army, went to Korea. And uh, then when I came back, I went to work for RCA. And I went to work and worked on the um, uh, microwave tubes, the microwave oven. Uh, in fact, when I told my wife what I was working on, I said, I'm working on a microwave oven. That's gonna, uh, that was in 1954. Uh, that was a long time ago. How many, how many people have microwave ovens today? Everybody does. Well, 1954, 1955, when they came out, they were about $3,000 a piece. I was working on one. I told my wife, and I've been, we've been married a long time. I told my wife that I was working on something called a microwave oven, and we were going to be able to cook a roast in a couple of minutes, and a potato in a couple of minutes. And she looked at me, and she said, that'll never sell. So, so uh, <laughs> anyways, that's what I worked on. Then I worked, I worked for General Dynamics on the Atlas and Centaur, and then in 19... Uh, uh, then in 1962, I went to the Johnson Space Center and worked very closely on, on the Apollo program. I worked very closely with the MIT Instrumentation Lab, now the Draper Labs, on the Guidance and Navigation and Control System. I became head of systems engineering in Apollo, then uh, manager of the command and service module in Apollo. Then I became the, uh, in August 72, I became the manager of the, of the uh, Space Shuttle Arbiter. Then I became director of research and engineering at Johnson Space Center. And then I became director of the Johnson Space Center. And then I became, for a while, I was associate deputy administrator, uh, excuse me, acting deputy administrator in Washington. And then I retired and went to Texas A&M to teach. And then Jeff asked me to come do this, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
me of something which, you know, not, not to divert the lecture today, That's but right. the, the fact that there was a, specifically a systems engineering group That's at right. the center which right. was separate from the project That's offices right. That's right. is something which is probably well, worth talking about at some point. Well, let me just make a mention of that. Uh, in Apollo, when we were in Apollo, we, uh, we sat around the table for many days and months trying to figure out how you define systems engineering. We really didn't know what systems engineering was. In fact, today, I'm not sure you'll get a clearly clear definition of what it is. I want to give you some examples as we go through the lecture. I'm going to give you some examples of what I think it is and how it was used. So uh, we'll do that. Uh, Let me say just one other thing. <laughs> sure. Um, Professor Cohen has, has these view graphs in electronic form down in Texas. And when he gets back, he'll send them to me and, and I will post them yeah. on the website. Well, I'll give you this whole package because there's also some pictures. You might, I don't know what you want to okay. do with the photos. Um, Something that's very key in any design and something you really need to, to pursue whenever you do a design project is understand the requirements. Because if you don't understand the requirements, you may get a very good product that's useful, useless. So you got to understand what your customer wants, the top level requirements. One thing that was handed down to us, it was supposed to be fully reusable. That was one requirement. 14 day turnaround time. You were, able, you were supposed to be able to turn the shuttle around in 14 days. Deploy and retrieve payloads. You have to de deploy the. You have to deploy a payload and you have to retrieve a payload. Design and development and test is estimated to be 5.1 billion dollars in 1971 dollars. Dale Myers didn't tell you the whole story, but one of the reasons that Dale Myers are such good friends, he was associate administrator of manned space flight. I was the orbiter project manager, and they, they being headquarters, headquarters is always there to help. Actually, got uh, actually took away two years of inflation. If they had given us those two years of inflation, we would have met the 5.1 billion dollars in 71 dollars, and Dale fought for that but lost. The original, here's where we missed it, the original cost per flight for 65,000 pounds was $10.5 million per flight in 1971 dollars, but for a flight rate of 60 flights per year. When I told my wife I was doing that, and she's been around the space program a long time, she said, you never agreed to that, did you? But uh, 60 flights per year is pretty hard to do. But that's what we came up with at the time. Now, Dale mentioned the Air Force requirements, but here was the Phase A studies. The Phase A studies were conducted to determine the base requirements and their effects on design in 1969. Uh, the principal issues were the size and weight of the payload, the cross range of the orbiter, and whether, what kind of heat material were you going to use. You've got to recognize that the heat resistance, we're going to use heat resistance structure or reusable uh, insulating material. You've got to recognize that our, our background was a Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and they all use an ablative material. An ablative material cannot be reused because basically the surface changes. You had to have some kind of insulating material so the surface did not change. Let me now go through, let me now go through very quickly for you, just for the sake of, of, uh, of uh, completeness. Dale showed you a few of the studies. I want to flash up a lot of studies, phase A studies, and just to let you take a look at what people were doing. Uh, and don't, you don't have to read the words, but you might just look at the, the diagram. Theirs was General Dynamics, a phase A study. There was North American Rockwell, that's when Dale was talking about, because that's where he was. And there was a phase B study for McDonnell Douglas. So that's what they all looked like at the time. I'm going to go through some, and then just for the sake of completeness here. Um, there was, again, another McDonnell Douglas study, Martin Marietta. And the last one was, uh, well, that was Mark Marietta. So those were basically some of the studies. So you can see they all had some kind of a wing type vehicle. However, there were. Already, they, most of those were delta wings. So delta wings. the decision had already been made. You probably heard the decision already made at cross range. Now, interestingly enough, and I'm going to quote some names to you, and you might go back and research it. Max Faget was like the lead engineer. He was a, sort of like a, uh, really a, just a, uh, sort of a man that was immortalized in terms of the space program. He felt we ought to go with the straight wing, which felt very, very strongly about a straight wing, but that eliminated the very large cost range that the Air Force needed. Straight wing was easier to build, not as high loads on it, and so forth. Uh, here, interestingly enough, 
you look at uh, Chrysler, Chrysler had a study, and Chrysler actually uh, had a capsule. So Chrysler had a capsule, but here were more vehicles, see? And people were really thinking about this time of a flyback booster, where you actually had a, a booster that returned and came back and landed, and then also had a manned vehicle that landed. So that's what the real requirement was at the time. Some Somebody uh, sort of commented about Chrysler, you know? Yeah. There was also Ford. Also Ford, had Ford, Aero, Ford Aeronautics. Had, I mean, thing, there were a lot of aerospace companies back yeah. in those days. Yeah. It's changed a lot, that's right. And here's uh, McDonnell Douglas, of course, uh, Grumman. So a lot of these studies, uh, then you're getting to see something already start to look a little bit like the shuttle. I'm almost through, I know this is... And here's more, these are I think getting maybe into the phase B studies. But uh, you can see some of them are starting to look like the existing shuttle. Uh, Lockheed. Okay, so now the shuttle studies, the principal issues, the principal issues in the shuttle studies, we're getting a little, now we're starting to get a little bit more technical and a little more detailed, is should the reaction control system, now the reaction control system is basically a propulsion system that controls the vehicle about its center of gravity. It's for attitude control, basically. So the basically, was should the reaction control system be liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, or should you use a uh, a uh, hypergolic system, where you don't, you just, you know, it's a storable type system. That was a big issue at the time. Uh, Every, everybody here know what hypergolic fuel is. Let's talk about it. Well, hypergolic fuel is a fuel that actually, uh, like hydrazine, it actually can, it actually uh, does not need a. It's actually got a, uh, an oxidizer and a and a uh, propellant in the same fuel. Now the other one was a fly-by-wire flight control system. That was a big issue. Do we have a fly-by-wire flight control system? And now everything has a fly-by-wire. All the all the military jets have a fly-by-wire. But basically, was it going to be a digital control, uh, computer control system, or were we going to have cables uh, fly the machine? That was a big issue, a very big issue at the time. Wind tunnel test to determine wing size and configuration. That is a, a very difficult thing to do, but that's this is starting to get into what you might say is systems engineering. This is starting to get into what you might say is systems engineering. Air breathing engines were considered for flyback and later determined to be too heavy. And some, sh and some uh, shuttle studies that still had to be done was the entry techniques, landing speed, what type of landing speed were we going to have, and the approach pattern. So these were some, some, all some, some things that had to be understood during the studies. The phase B studies, the phase B studies were performed in mid-1970s to determine the preliminary design. The results showed a re fully recoverable orbiter, disposable fuel tank, parachute recoverable solid rocket boosters, high performance hydrogen oxygen engines placed in the orbiter to be recovered. This was all systems engineering that led up to the design. So you have systems engineering in very fa various phases of the program. And usually systems engineering composes of an interdisciplinary team that has given, been given some assumptions, some constraints, they have some top level requirements, they do an iterative process with some uh, 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 tools such as uh, computer tools for calculation of loads and uh, flight mechanics, and they come up with an iteration of, uh, of what the design is going to be. So that's basically how it was done. Now, some of the, some of that was sort of like the ground rules. Some of the things that came out of it, once we started putting the total system together, we showed that the fully reusable with a flyback booster was greater than $5.1 billion. So that was thrown out. Now, there is a question, and that's what I asked Dale, should we have said, hey, we need money to really have a flyback booster? But they gave us a constraint of $5.1 billion, $5 billion in $1970. And it didn't make it. And I showed you many configurations were studied. And the turnaround time, the turnaround time of 14 days, 
that dictated a landing with a ring, wing vehicle on a runway. You weren't going to be able to land this in the water or with parachutes. You were going to have to land it on a runway so you could quickly turn it around in 14 days. The payload deployment and retrieval requirement determined the location of the orbiter on the launch configuration. Because if you look at that large payload bay, it'd be very difficult to put that on top of the vehicle. One of the requirements that NASA has now that the, the CEV should be on top of the stack. Well, if you're going to have that large of vehicle, it's pretty hard to put it on top of the stack. And particularly with wings. With wings, yes. So this is what we had to come up with. This is some of the results. of the, These are all system studies. This is systems engineering. Now, now you're getting to look at what what um, what the design is starting to look like. Um, this is the agency commitment in March of 1972. In May of 1972, uh, you had the North American proposal, and then I became Orbiter Project Manager in August of 1972. We did a study, and PRR is the Preliminary Requirements Review. But that was the configuration. We made some changes, and the production commitment was made in May of 1973. This chart is not, it's sort of a gee whiz chart at, the, at one point in time, which showed, which showed the $1971 cost per flight for the Thor, the Atlas, the Titan 3C, the Saturn 1B, and the shuttle, and that's payload, to, uh, to orbit. So you can see that the thing that was really missed in the shuttle was the $10.5 million cost per flight. Yes, sir? What is the notch on top of the, the second tier that disappeared in the production company? Let's see. see I'm sorry. The top oh, that, this, that up there? Yeah. That was their data probe. Okay. It was taken off because it wasn't needed. And, okay. okay. Good question. Thank you. And by the way, don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask me questions anytime. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, please stop me, tell me to slow down, or ask me any questions you'd like to, to ask me. There are eight pair data probes on the shuttle. Shuttle. But not on the tank. Not on the tank. Okay, major configuration decisions. And by the way, you don't see them on the shuttle because they're inside the thermal protection system and they're only sort of turned outwards to take data when you get down to about Mach 3 and you're through the heating. Yeah. Otherwise, they would burn off during the... Now, the approach and landing test, they were out front. Yeah. Approach and landing test, when we, when we separated from the 747. I'm going to tell you that story in a minute. Uh, okay, here's some of the major decisions. We were going to go with a hydrogen oxygen main engine this size now that's one of the system problems you have to decide once you once you decide what kind of propellant what kind of engine you're going to use that basically sizes the external the, the tankage and I'll show you that on another chart but we, uh, this is I said this size the liquid oxygen hydrogen tanks which is not reusable and I'll, show, I'll make that point to you a little later on but once you decide what kind of engine you're going to use that size is the tank because of the uh, using the equations of motion you can, I'll get your question you can figure out how much propellant you need you get the density of the propellant and now you know what size tank you're going to use yes sir a couple slides back you said the main engines of the orbiter had to be Covered. Right. Was that that was separate from the orbiter? No, it wasn't. It was a separate contract, but it was placed inside the orbiter. So when the orbiter came back, the engines came back with it. Right. Is that was that your question? Yeah. It was. It was. It, for example, the Johnson Space Center was responsible for the orbiter, and you're going to have the person talk that was responsible for the engine, J.R. Thompson, and he was the director of the Marshall. His, he was at the Marshall Space Flight Center, but the orbiter was installed. Uh, that the engines were installed in the orbiter, so the orbiter brought them back. Solid rocket boosters provide the additional propulsion required to get the orbiter in orbit, and the solid rocket boosters were designed to be recoverable and reused. So those were some of the st system studies that led to the configuration. Yes, sir? At that period, was there uh, any discussion of the environmental impact of solids being used in system Yes, there was. There was quite a bit. There was quite a bit. I don't recall the details, but I do know there was a lot of work going on on, on, solid, on that, and that many solids being used. And I guess uh, we basically put that to rest, but there was a lot. I don't know the details of it. In fact, that might be a good question. If you're not here, we'll ask J.R. Thompson, because J.R. should know that. I mean... When I, when I met with some of the Russians who worked on the Borat, which was the Russian copy of the show, right, right. Uh, one of the big changes was that they said, how could the Americans have used solids? For that many flights. 
It was studied and actually put to bed, or put to rest, should I say. I don't know the details, uh, but it's a very good question. And that's something I think they're going to be very speakers, as I said, and JR should, he should have that answer. It's not to recover and reused. Well, some of the things I've said before, the arbiter decisions, uh, the, the arbiter entry cross range required delta wings. To go 1,100 nautical miles cross range, you needed delta wings. Deletion of the air breathing engines for moving, the arbiter, for moving arbiter required the Boeing 747 to carry the arbiter. Let me tell you that story. All of you are very familiar now that when we landed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, we put the arbiter on top of the 747 and we ferry it back, fly it back to uh, uh, Kennedy. Well, I was the arbiter project manager and I, got, I became arbiter project manager in August of 72 and I was having all sorts of problems. The first thing they did to me was they cut my budget in half. The OMB cut my budget in half. So that was the first thing that happened. And then I just had a lot of problems. So, but I had worked on the Apollo program. I had a lot of friends in the organization, although I was arbiter project manager. Three of my friends came into the office one afternoon. Uh, I forgot, maybe two or three months after we started. And said, Aaron, we got a great idea. I said, what's that? He said, we can put the arbiter on top of a 747 or a DC-10 and ferry it and fly it back to Kennedy from, from Edwards Air Force Base. We may have to make one or two stops, ferry back. I looked at him for a moment. I said, that is absolutely the dumbest <laughs> idea I've heard in my life. <laughs> and I basically threw the people out of my office. And they were my friends. Well, these people will not take no for an answer. It happened to be they had another very good quality. They were all world-class model airplane builders. And these guys had won competition all over the world, three of them. So they came back about 10 days later, said, you know, I don't know how many have seen the Johnson Space Center, but we have a lot of acreage out there, Texas. And they said, uh, come out, we want to show you something. They had built a radio-controlled model of, a, of the 747 and an arbiter, and actually flew it for me and separated the arbiter from the 747. So that's how it got started. That's how, that, and so we eliminated the air-breathing engines. But, but I, I remember th throwing them out of the, the office. Five by wire with a digital autopilot. Yes, sir. Are you saying that if, uh, if you had every engines, the order itself would fly back? Yeah, let me, I, yeah that's a good question. I, I missed that point. Let me explain to you. If you recall, that's exactly right. When the arbiter lands, you know, in the landing gear, the nose gear is very short. So it's, it's, what we had to do, what we had to do, and you asked a very pertinent question, we had to actually replace the landing gear with a different landing gear that caused the arbiter to have an attitude like that. We put air breathing like this, so it wasn't like this, it was like this. We put uh, air breathing engines on and we took off and we had to have five in-flight refuelings to get from, uh, get from uh, 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 California. Strap, strap on yeah, yeah, engine. yeah. And plus a different landing gear. And we took off horizontally and f five in-flight refuelings to get from California to Florida. So that's the real, and you really brought up a important point that I left out. That's the reason why we changed it. Thank you very much. And of course, we went with the fly-by-wire with a digital autopilot. This was a very fundamental change. The astronauts at that time did not like this very much. Uh, now, when you get all these new pilots in, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know, what, what are you talking about, fly-by-wire? Why not have a fly-by-wire system? But they didn't like it at one time. But we went with the fly-by-wire with a digital autopilot. I'm going to talk a little bit more, even though you're going to have a special briefing on the guidance navigation control system, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about that because that happens to be my expertise. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detail. Yes, sir. It means that you actually have a computer actually controls the surfaces. Okay. Whereas in, a, in, a, in, a, in an airplane, in, in past airplanes, you, your stick actually had cables that controlled the surfaces. So you get a lot more performance out of it. I mean, uh, okay. It's a little bit confusing in the sense that a wire, you, you might don't think of it as a, as, a, as a hard wire, which is like the old type of an airplane right. where there was a cable. Right. So when you pulled on the stick, there was actually a cable which went back to the ailerons and the, and the rudder and everything. And, and you know, as, as Professor Cohen says, everything now has a computer in the middle. And what you're really doing is flying the computer. Flying computer. And the computer then issues the commands to the hydraulic system. But that was, the shuttle, I guess, was the first. Our shuttle was the first vehicle one. Yeah. Yeah. That, that really had that system. That's right, it, exactly. it was, there, were, there were no commercial planes flying with that Our, system. Oh, military planes flying. Yeah, I mean, they... 
Yeah, it's, so so it was, um, and and uh, you know the 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 real concern was safety and reliability. That's you right. Know, suppose you have a computer problem. What what, what are you, you what are you going to do? I'm going to talk about that in detail. But that's that's a good question. Any other questions? Those are very good questions. I appreciate. It. Yes, sir. Can you just explain cross range. Cross range. Basically, uh, you realize the arbiter is. Uh, a glider, uh, so to speak, a glider. Not much of a glider, but a glider. And uh, it actually, downrange would be going in this direction. Cross range would be out of plane, basically, out of plane direction. So you can actually maneuver out of plane. We, we've got a, gl a, a nice globe here. I'm not going to carry it up to the front. I don't have a piece of chalk either, but. Here, here uh, Jeff, Jeff, there you are. Good qu These are oh, very okay. good questions, by the way. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, so, you know, here's the U.S. Roughly, so this this was designed for the military requirements. Okay, so so they wanted to be able for reconnaissance satellites. Basically, you want to be in polar orbit because you're going around. Let's say this is an orbit here, and then the Earth turns underneath it, and so you basically fly over all parts of the Earth. So that was that was the basic military requirement. They wanted to be able to launch out of Vandenberg on the west coast into a polar orbit. Um, and because of security reasons, uh, they basically, I mean, you know, th this sounds a little bit strange when we think back on it, but you wanted in, the, in a time of crisis, remember we were in the Cold War and everything, you wanted to be able to put a satellite up without necessarily giving the other side a chance to make all the radar measurements on the shuttle and everything and figure out right away where the satellite is. And, and also there might be hostilities, they may be, you know, the shuttle was a strategic asset. So basically they wanted the shuttle to be able to, to land the very next orbit. Well, all right, you, you take off from California, you, you fly over the pole, you deploy your satellite, and by the way, we have never ever, with all the satellites we've deployed, we've, we've never deployed a satellite on the first orbit. That would be an incredible feat, but that was the requirement. So you fly over the pole, you come back around, now you're ready to land in California, but during that time, the Earth has turned by a thousand miles. Okay, you know, it's 24,000 mile circumference and, and 24 hours and actually 1,500 miles because an orbit is 90 minutes, one and a half hours. So, so your, your orbit now would put you right over the Pacific Ocean. If you just burn your engine, slow down, and come, come down through the atmosphere, that's where you're going to land. So instead, as you're flying through the atmosphere, you basically have to, be, have to come down banked on your side, and, and so essentially you're, you're generating a lift vector, and instead of turning your lift vector up, you turn your lift vector to the side, and that pushes you over, and delta wings can generate a higher lift vector than, than the straight wings, and that was the determining factor. Very good. Uh, Jeff, where, where I, could you mention the, <coughs> me, the issue of also land, landing on land in friendly territory, uh, as far as cross range? Well, I think that's right. I guess I'm not sure I can address that. Can you address that, Jeff? I don't... Uh, my, re my recollection of the time was that even coming in over the Pacific, yes, you could, yes, there are some places where you could land, but it would mean, on, on well, land, but it would mean landing in the Soviet, Soviet Union or, yeah. or, or, or Eastern Europe, but they didn't want to do that. Yeah. So the, so the cross range traditionally would well, be able to make Australia. Well, I'm sure that's yeah, right. There were certainly, there were, there were right. contingent sure right. landing sites yeah. that we had all over the world. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. I, I guess I can't address right, that. Right. Too. They it could have been a much smaller cross range if we were willing to and and you know I, I will say continue to to remind us if if we don't explain some basic things because you know we, we've been dealing yeah. with for this for so long that that some of these things just seem like second nature and you know you you weren't even born when when the shuttle started flying and and uh, so you know the, the level of backgrounds is going to be very different we want to bring everybody along with us so you know if there's something that we say the same thing you know the question about hypergolic fuel yeah. if 
if we use a term and you don't understand it, we'll try not to use a lot of acronyms. Right. I can't guarantee that the well, speakers won't use yeah. acronyms. Don't be embarrassed to just stop and say, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, what are you talking about? But as we go through the course, you're going to get more detail, more detail. For example, you have a total uh, lecture by a man named Henry Pohl who's going to talk about the rea uh, reaction control system. He'll give you all the details you want to know about hypergolics and storables, more than you ever want to know. So you're going to get more details as you go through. But don't hesitate to ask questions because it's good for us. Um, you know, it's an interesting story about, uh, let me tell you another uh, satellite story. My wife was, we moved to College Station, and my wife was working at a junior college and uh, in the registrar's office, and she's working with a young lady, and Apollo 13 came out. Well, I happened to be, the pro Apollo 13 happened to be my first, uh, first uh, uh, project, uh, first uh, mission when I was a uh, manager of the command and service module. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. In fact, I'm going to give a lecture in Dick Batten's course on uh, on the 26th on Apollo 13. But uh, uh, my wife talked to this young lady, and she said, I want to see Apollo 13 uh, yesterday. And she said, it was so exciting. I didn't know how it was going to end. So, you know, so, uh, so you know, it, it, it is, a, it is a, a frame of reference. Well, we talk, we've talked about this. Size of the payload bay is 60 feet long by 15 feet diameter. Size of the crew cabin defined to be over 2,600 cubic feet. The payload, as you know, is 65,000 pounds at liftoff, 35 pounds at landing. And what you need to understand is the Arbiter is a launch vehicle, it's a spacecraft, and it's an aircraft. And when you look at the two different missions, or two different systems, I worked on Apollo, as I said very much, and on shuttle. And there's no question that the shuttle is the most complicated, much more complicated than Apollo. On the other hand, the Apollo mission is much more complicated than shuttles. But, but uh, that's something that, uh, this is something that makes it very, very interesting. This is a very old chart. And in fact, this is the original chart. It comes out yellow. This was the original cost estimate. This was the original cost estimate and how they rallied up the ta they they totaled up the 5.15 billion dollars. We talked about that and that was the very original cost estimate done on a on a on a uh, cost analyst chart. There were no uh, computers at the, no personal computers at the time and uh, but that is a, a very in fact I found that that in my files that's a very old yellow chart. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to believe some of those numbers. On the other hand, uh, I had a, a gentleman work for me. He got his PhD at University of Colorado, and his subject was the cost of the shuttle arbiter. And it turns out that we did, if we had that two years of inflation, we really would have made that cost uh, on the 5.15 in 1971 dollars. Now, let me get it. It only ran over by about 10 percent. Uh, yeah, that's sure. right. Yeah. Let's now talk a little bit about uh, configuration. I don't know if you can see this chart or not. But this is now you, you might say, how did you go? How did you go from that uh, conception of in August of 1972 to something with all these numbers on it? Now that is a true. This is really a case in systems engineering, and let me explain to you what I mean by that. Um, there were certain assumptions had to be made. One assumption was that was that in the arbiter. It was going to weigh about 175,000 pounds without payload, and you were going to have a 65,000-pound payload. That was you made that assumption. You had to make that assumption. You also had to make an assumption that uh, that uh, you were going to use a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine. And why did you select that? Yeah, and today I'm not quite sure that was a good, good decision, but we did. They decided, why? Because the specific impulse, the ISP, or the performance of the engine, was, it was the highest for the uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, chemical propulsion that we know today. So we selected that. Well, when you use the equations of motion, you integrate the equations of motion, or you use the, or, or any other techniques you may want to use, you then show what, how much propellant you're going to need to get that into orbit. Then you know that liquid hydrogen has a density of about four pounds per cubic foot. Very low density. So that means this big external tank is mostly hydrogen. It's very, very big volume. And liquid oxygen is about 70 pounds per cubic foot. So that basically sizes your external tank. 
So that's a, that's a system. I mean, it's a very simplified approach, but that system's engineering, and you do, you get do much iteration because there's an old adage that the devil's in the details. So you keep iterating on that with this expert team, and then you uh, you then say, well. That's still not going to be the most efficient way to get you to orbit. So you say you need a really a stage system. So you put the solid rocket boosters on, so you don't have a single, what they call a single stage to orbit. You really have more like a two stage to orbit. And you size the solid rocket boosters. And you determine when they have to come off. So basically that is how you go about doing the systems approach, using a systems engineering to come up with a configuration. Now, that's, that's a very oversimplified way of doing it, or a statement I made, but that's basically how you do it. And these are some of the dimensions that then come out of the, of the vehicle. And I, I think they're in that handout we gave you also, and it looks like I'm going to take off. I did know that this, this chart tries to lift off on me. My charts are, I don't know what's the best way to do it. So that, yeah, I think those dimensions are, you can find those dimensions, I believe, in that paper that was handed out. But that shows you all the dimensions of the, of, the, uh, of the space shuttle system, the solid rocket boosters, the external tank, and the orbiter. Now, an interesting sidelight, an interesting sidelight in this, uh, which I got to thinking about after the Columbia accident, where the foam came off. Of course, the reason why we put foam on was because with liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, at those temperatures, you're going to have a lot of ice formed. And when ice forms, it comes down and hits the arbiter about the, with the thermal protection system, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail, you're going to do some damage. So one solution would be to put foam on the tank to eliminate the, the ice. And of course, you would assume that foam could stay on the tank. Another solution would have been to not go with a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine. Go with what we call storables. Of course, they wouldn't have gotten much, as much performance, and you probably put, couldn't put 65,000 pounds of payload into orbit. But those are some of the. But so the point I bring this to you: those are some of the decisions as you go into various projects. You need to challenge the requirements because the requirements are really going to decide what kind of uh, system you're going to have. So that's that's really the point I wanted to make. Are there any questions? Yes, yes. Wasn't it possible to have isolated from the inside so, so that well, the outside was not that good? One, that's a good question. One thought, one thought at one time, was to put the liquid hydrogen tank or the liquid hydrogen tank in the orbiter, and that would basically isolate you. Put it inside, so or put insulation on the inside, as you pointed out. That, those were thought out, thought about. And in fact, uh, I don't recall the, uh, the decision. Obviously, not to do it, but I don't recall the reason why. But when J.R. Thompson comes. Uh, I'll ask him that question because, uh, but that, that's a very good question. We well, yes, there was two things. One, could you put, could you put some of this propellant inside the tank, and the other is could you put insulation inside the uh, inside the tank itself, and that was looked at, and I, I guess it was complicated and very costly to do it that way, but it was looked at. That's a very good question. By the way, these are very good questions. So, you know, one, I mean, one thing when when you look at the this external tank. Only the very upper part is for oxygen. That's right. Because the density of hydrogen is, is so low. I mean, all of the all of this part of the tank is for hydrogen. So to have put all the hydrogen inside the orbiter, we would have a very different looking orbiter. Yeah, you wouldn't have been able to do it. But she but she really said, could you put insulation inside the tank? Which uh, yeah, is, which yeah. Is, I and the other. Yeah. Any other questions? But that's basically how the system evolved. Now, you know, I oversimplified it to quite an extent, but you got to realize there was a lot of iterations. One other key thing, though, when you have a system team, when you, when you have do systems engineering, you do it in a team. You usually have different uh, capabilities on the team. Aeros, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. So you have different types of disciplines on the, on the systems engineering team that can help you do that. And then you have a systems engineer that sort of heads it up. But that was, a, that was the real, uh, we're, we're going to concentrate more on the arbiter, and, and when we have one of the speakers, he's going to concentrate on the engine and so forth. But um, that's what the system looked like. The other thing that's interesting, I think, is what the mission profile essentially looked like. Look, this, was a t this happens to be for STS-5, but this is the basic mission profile. Uh, now, let me add, before I start that, let me say, uh, this gentleman right here has, has flown that profile five times. 
and uh, so he's done that five times. He can talk much more about it than I can. One time, uh, when I was, I always tell this story, just probably tired, tired of hearing it, but when, when I was director of the Johnson Space Center, uh, we had a lot of visitors. So one time I had Mr. Uh, James Baker, who at that time was Secretary of State, and Edward Chavanazzi from Russia, who had the same position in Russia at the time. And I took him over to Mission Control uh, as a visit and put uh, Mr. Chavanazzi down in the, in the seat, in the, in the flight controller seat, and was going to let him talk to the crew. So uh, not knowing that Jeff Hoffman was on, on duty at the time, uh, uh, Edward Chavanazzi uh, spoke in Russian up to the crew, and before the interpreter could answer it, down comes this beautiful answer in Russian from Jeff Hoffman. So that really floored, that really floored the uh, uh, both Mr. Baker and Edward Chavanazzi and me. So uh, that was an interesting story. Um, here gives you a little profile of the shuttle mission. You lift off and you've reached dynamic pressure, max dynamic pressure in about one minute, about 38,000 feet. That's where you reach dynamic pressure. You have the SRB step in about two minutes. You remember in the, the, challenge, in the challenge action, I believe it happened in about 60 seconds, but in two minutes you get SRB step and it lands, uh, the, the SRB landing by parachutes. You have MECO, which is main engine cut off. The main engine cuts off, and that to me is the, is the biggest issue. But when that main engine has to burn for over eight minutes, that's taking all the propellant out of that big tank, the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, firing the main engines to get you to uh, Main, what's the velocity of main engine cutoff? Do you know? It's pretty much orbital. It's almost orbital it's, velocity. It's, it's, it's within a few hundred feet yeah. per second of orbital velocity. Yeah. And then you get ET, external tank separation. The external tank comes down uh, in about 9,000 miles downrange and lands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, then you use the orbital maneuvering system, the Ohm's engine, the pods on the back of the orbiter. Use that for a very short period of time to get you to use your final tune to get into orbit. Then you have your on orbit operations, whatever you're going to do, go out and service the Hubble or whatever. You de orbit with the Ohm's engine, the orbital moving system engine. You have entry interface at 400,000 feet. And why do you pick 400,000 feet? Because that's where you pick, that's where you start sensing gravity. You get about 0.05 G's at uh, 400,000 feet. And then you re enter and land either at Edwards or, uh, or Kennedy. So that's the typical mission probe, yes? Why does the shuttle turn whenever it's turn? Why does it turn? Yeah, it turns and it's down and the down part. You mean lift off? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, why? That's a very good question. Uh, let's see if I can repeat that very accurately. The fact is that we used the Apollo launch pad and the ditches for the flame bucket where the engine goes. So in order to get it to the right attitude, we had to make that maneuver. To, you had to make that roll maneuver during liftoff. Is that what you're talking about, roll maneuver during liftoff? Then we had to make that roll maneuver because we weren't in the right orientation. We had to make a roll maneuver because it wasn't oriented correctly on the pad. Now, let me, let me, let me answer your question. Uh, the Buran, the Buran was a Russian vehicle. Well, uh, Dan Brandenstein, who at one time was an astronaut, head of the astronaut office, uh, saw that the Russians made this roll maneuver. And he asked the Russians, why do you make that roll maneuver? I mean, they didn't have to do it. He said, because you do. <laughs> and so, uh, now that's a true story. Did you hear that story? Yeah. 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 Did I say it correctly? I think so. Yeah. yeah, he said, because you do. So that, that is a good question. So that's, but that's why I mean. There, there may be one other aspect to it, and that's the question of why does the shuttle actually fly upside down on the way up? And I believe the original decision was aerodynamics, yeah, because right. the, you know, it, it, the, the thrust is asymmetric. You have the external tank, and the shuttle is sitting on the external tank, and, and so the, the, the thrust actually has to be through the center of mass of the whole system, so it's actually flying not straight but it's a little bit skewed and for aerodynamic purposes I guess they figured there was less stress That's although recently they've, they've started part way through the launch they they do another roll maneuver uh, and I think that's for communications yeah. um, and I'm, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure when they started doing that again I'm but, not sure either but the, the the early part of the the launch when you ride in the solids and aerodynamically when you you go through max Q you're you're in much better shape if you're upside down yes oh, let's look at this Nick. What's the 
I'm sorry. Was there any particular reason for you guys to use a small solid rocket and a big liquid rocket? Like, why, why, why couldn't you use just as big solid rocket as possible? They minimize the liquid fuel carriage or something like that? Well, if you use a big solid rocket booster, it's not very efficient. You really have to, that's why you use the, many people have studied single stage to orbits. And Let me just ask, um, yeah. are, are people here, I, I know we've got a mixture of Aero Astro and, and TPP ESD, um, are there people here who have, who have not seen uh, the rocket equation? So everybody is well. Okay, L let me just very, yeah, that's good. That's, very, right, very that's very briefly. Important. That's very important. Um, that's very important. If, if you yeah. have uh, you have a rocket and you want to increase the velocity of the rocket, I mean that's that's a critical uh, thing uh, by a certain delta v. Um, you can take the mass of the rocket when you when you start the burn, which we call m sub i the initial mass, and the final mass, and of course the initial mass equals the, fi the final mass plus the mass of the propellant, and that equals the exponential to the negative power of the velocity decrement which you're trying to put in divided by the exhaust velocity of the propellant that's coming out. Now, this is usually phrased in terms of the specific, what we call the specific impulse times gravity because it's done by engineers and, right. and you know. Yeah, that's right. So you'll, you'll hear the reference to the, the, the uh, specific impulse and the units of that are seconds, but if you multiply that by the gravitational acceleration it will actually give you the exhaust velocity. Because this is in an exponential, it's extremely sensitive to the exhaust velocity. Whatever delta V you're trying to get out, if you can uh, add a few more seconds to the uh, specific impulse, then the actual mass of propellant that you have to burn in order to create that delta V goes down substantially. Now for uh, hydrogen oxygen, the specific impulse right. is about right. 450 50 seconds. seconds. For solid rocket motors, it's about um, the specific impulse is on the order of about 250. 250. That's, what I, thought, like that's that. what I thought. It was about 250. Yeah, it's about 250. So you you know that's almost a factor of two, and you put that into an exponent. If you try to get into orbit with a purely a solid rocket motor, um, you need a lot more propellant, and that means the the mass that you're able to payload mass you can take into orbit uh, is is reduced. That's why, in addition to using hydrogen and oxygen, and you know we'll have some lectures a lecture specifically on the main engine. But I mean they they got every last ounce of performance out of it. You know by running it. You know you'll hear references to running it at 104 percent of rated thrust, 109 percent of rated thrust, uh, and and all of these have engineering consequences because in order to increase the exhaust velocity, which of course if you do that, that's in the denominator, so that's going in the right direction, you have to increase the chamber pressure, the temperature, and all of the design problems. He's going to ask you the question, why don't you use liquids all the way? Yeah, so, so, <laughs> I, knew yeah, I, knew, I knew what your question was. Why don't you use liquids? more and so forth, so my next question why did you to the well, but single. He said, why don't you use the the liquid hydrogen engine all the way rather than using solid rocket boosters? Well, um, the the principle. Uh, first of all, you know, why not just have a bigger fuel tank, one big fuel tank, and just use the shuttle engine? That's what he said. That would be essentially single stage to, to orbit. orbit. And that, the the. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time yeah. with the rocket equation, but the delta V that you need to get into orbit 
is, well, orbital velocity it's is just second. under eight kilometers per second, right. but to that you have to add Dr gravity a loss, gravity loss and, and, and a drag velocity. term, and, yeah. and so the overall delta V is a little over nine, effectively about nine kilometers per second. If, if you put that into the equation, it actually, you can get the ratio of the final to the initial masses, and even for a, uh, a, a hydrogen oxygen engine, you can basically almost 95% of the mass sitting on the launch pad has to be propellant, propellant, which means that all of your structure can only be about 5%. Now if we could, if we could make super strong, super light structures... Like an eggshell. Um, then, in principle, we could get to orbit without staging. That was that was the dream. Now, that's the, the first thing you learn in you know rockets 101 is why you can't do single staged orbit. It's well, because it, right now we don't have the technology. Well, and see, to do and that. many people have studied single staged orbit. In fact, uh, tried, are, we NASA tried to build one. We tried to build one. And, and we it, failed. And uh, we failed. <laughs> well, what they say is really what you need is to be as smart as or, or as high tech as an eggshell be able to make the structure as thin as an eggshell, hold all the fluid in it, and have very low density. Uh, 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 yeah, some, low someday, someday, we will someday have maybe we'll do it. So there was the structural limit of the liquid fuel tank, and the rest of it was compensated by side yeah. yeah, Basically, uh, you know, when you, when you, by, by, Go, by using uh, the, the boosters or in a more traditional rocket, a, a, a first stage, once you've exhausted the fuel, then you drop the, the, all of that structural that. mass. And so for the second stage, this initial mass becomes much lower. That's right. And, and so you can get a See, lot more payload. Let me just add one thing. To, to, the, the other thing that's interesting is that if you go back to Apollo, during Apollo, there were three ways to go to the moon. One was direct. Von Braun wanted to build a large vehicle called the Nova, where you actually lift it off from the Cape and sent the whole vehicle right to the moon. The other was to do Earth orbital rendezvous, and the other way was to do lunar orbital rendezvous like we did. It turns out that that Nova vehicle was so big, had to be so big, that that was ruled out. So we wound up with Earth orbital rendezvous or lunar family went, went lunar orbital rendezvous. Yes, sir. Um, how much did uh, a role the geography play in the design considerations? Because, I mean, just, just looking at that, I mean, you have to have the external tank separated at a specific a lot, time. Quite a bit, hit, quite a bit. Not hidden, you know, after. But yeah. we're talking about launching at Vandenberg, I mean. Well, launching yeah, Vandenberg, we, uh, originally we thought about launching out of, uh, of uh, uh, New Mexico, too. Mm -hmm. But you did, I don't know, you want to say, but you had to have that. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, when you're doing flight design, flight design. One, of, one of the, depending on, on whether you're going into a... Uh, a due east launch to go into a 28 degree orbit or a high inclination orbit, you actually, the, the, the placement of the external tank uh, re-entry is a major Man, factor we spend a lot of time flight to design and, and in fact often the trajectory has to be shaped you know, it to, to be not quite as efficient as it might otherwise be, because you have to control the the, the landing of the external tank. But uh, your question is good. When I did some consulting for a company uh, after I got out of uh, after I retired, uh, and we were looking at a commercial launch vehicle, and uh, we were trying to launch uh, uh, trying to launch the vehicle out of uh, various places in the United States, and it's very difficult to get approval because of the of the concerns they have for, for that. <laughs> For, for any types of failures or anything that you're going to do. Yes, sir. I'm not sure why I thought this, but I was under the impression that the external tank burned up in the atmosphere. No. And didn't hit down. So there's like a hundred fuel tanks. It breaks up. It breaks up. It breaks up. It, breaks up. Breaks up it, does. Not, it doesn't come down as one big lob. It does some of it up. burns up, but, but some, of it, some of it does get back to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there any, any talk about a need to clean up all of that? Uh, all that well, I haven't yet. yet. No. <laughs> I'm not an astronaut. That's, no. that's mainly <laughs> aluminum. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen but, inside evaporate, and they're they're non toxic. The, the question that uh, uh, Dr. Young asked about the uh, uh, solid rocket booster uh, environmental problem is, is a real problem that uh, that uh, had to be solved or had to be. Uh, I, the other problem I had, I worked on the trying to get the Galileo cleared because it had a radio, a radio thermonuclear generator on it to get uh, that cleared going into orbit is a big job. I, I worked on that and I thought I'd never finish it, but, I, but we finally got it cleared, but it was a, a very tough job to get RTGs cleared to, to be launched. Yeah, I, don't, I don't remember specifically 
all the noxious chemicals that come out of the solid rocket boosters, but it's it's pretty nasty stuff. Yeah, it is. I, I remember one one of my launches. They, the families and guests, are taken to a, a launch site viewing area about three miles inland from the launch pad, and it just so happened that the the wind was blowing on shore that day. It was it was an afternoon launch, and and my brother is a real space nut, and he always liked to to watch as the rocket went. You know the the whole after about seven and a half minutes it just sort of disappears over the horizon but after about five minutes the the solid rocket exhaust was actually approaching the spectator uh, area because of the wind blowing and they made everybody get on the buses and drive them away so that nobody got uh, got injured and my, my brother was really annoyed because he, he didn't want to leave. If we have time, uh, if we have time for my lectures, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Challenger accident. Uh, talk to you about the O-ring seal. I, I would like to talk to you about that because uh, I don't want to sweep those things under the rug but I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that because I've got my own thoughts on, on the problem and I'd like you, to, like you to hear it. Okay, any other questions on the mission profile? What should we Keep, keep going or uh, yeah. um, tell you what let's take a two minute break stand up right. turn around uh, an hour is a uh, long enough time to sit for a bit Good, thank you. I, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody is aware that the Russians at one time had a space shuttle program uh, and they manufactured a vehicle which looked almost identical, not exactly, but almost right. identical, and it was no accident because they used our plans. They used plans, used our thermal protection system right. too. So. Um, and uh, they only ended up flying it once, and they actually flew it unmanned. Man. They flew it unmanned. Uh, and um, despite a little bit of, of nail biting during the landing, they, they did recover it successfully. Um, and then they discovered just what we had discovered was that this is a lot more expensive to operate than they had anticipated, and they had a lot less money than we did, and so it basically never flew again. They had. Uh, they had crews of cosmonauts who had been training to fly the Buran. But the, there were actually two differences. Uh, the first was that they put the engines on the external tank. I think that this, uh, it, this did two things. First of all, it did improve the performance. Um, and also, the Russians were turning out, I mean, they turned out engines on assembly lines, basically. They, 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 they turn out a tremendous number of rocket engines, and I guess that from their point of view, uh, and I don't know the details of the performance of their engine, how, how their main engines compared to, uh, to ours, uh, I think they actually had four engines, if I remember. Uh, I think they did, yeah. The orbiter was just a glider, and uh, it, it was no difference. It was an unpowered glider. The other thing that they they did learn one thing from us that the the when you're using when you have a delta wing vehicle, you're very very sensitive to the center of mass of the system, uh, and and it was a problem because you have to f you know the orbiter when it flies back through the atmosphere flies through a, a flight regime. It hits the top of the atmosphere at Mach 25 and then it flies all the way down to subsonic and the, the uh, control characteristics and stability characteristics change throughout that flight envelope and we'll, we'll have a lecture specifically on the aerodynamics of the shuttle. Um, but it turns out that the shuttle is extremely sensitive to the forward CG and and I think it was around the Mach 3 flight regime if you're just an inch or two forward of a critical area in the CG you can lose control and and so um, we actually um, on many flights they, they always do a weight and balance on the shuttle before launch and on many flights we've actually had to put lead ballast in the aft 
engine compartment of the shuttle just to get the uh, CG far enough back to get Mach 3 stability. I hate to tell you how many tons of lead we've launched into orbit over the co course of the shuttle program because of the CG. And, and if you look at the, the delta wing profile of Buran is slightly different from the orbiter because I guess they learned the lesson and, and so they were not as sensitive to the CG. But of course once, once you build it, an orbiter, you, you can't really change it and um, and so we were sort of stuck well, with it. One of the other concerns was that uh, having the, uh, the orbiter with the thrust behind the orbiter and this large mass in the tank, you could get what you call pogo. You could get a, a pogo type of activity, a pogo. And so one concept that Max Vajay had early in the program was to have a swing engine, actually have the engines uh, fire on the back of the tank and then actually when you get ready to separate the tank, swing the engines back into the orbiter and bring them back in the orbiter. That was uh, we, we threw that out. That was a little complicated Me mechanisms. You're going to have a discussion on mechanisms and mechanical systems and mechanism mechanical systems. Everybody can design them, but everybody has a hard time making them work. Uh, there's everybody when you put up a mechanism, when you put up an electrical schematic, nobody everybody accepts it. When you put up a mechanical drawing of a of a, of a, of a mechanical system, everybody's got an idea how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. I got some pictures now just to show you. Uh, you've shown the profile, and then of course you've seen the vehicle when it gets to the rollout of the uh, assembly building. There it's stacked. And uh, then it's on a crawler that uh, this crawler basically was used for Apollo, and the crawler takes the vehicle out to the pad. Just one thing so that people notice the difference here. Um, can anyone. It's gonna is fly. anyone familiar enough with Apollo to be able to, to, to say what the fundamental difference is with the, the crawler mechanism here and, and the crawler and the pad? Not sure. Well, if you look at the picture of a, of a Saturn rocket being rolled out on the it's crawler, the whole launch tower was on the crawler. Oh, that's right, yeah. And so they rolled the whole, the whole thing out. Um, with the shuttle, it's a little different. Um, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll be bringing in some pictures at, at some point to show you some of these details, but uh, they, they actually they cut off the top part of the, of the uh, Saturn launch tower because the shuttle stack isn't quite as tall, and they added a movable, pay, what's called a payload changeout, uh, fixture, and so once the the shuttle actually gets on the pad, this this is there's a, actually railroad tracks here. Is this, this a better this picture. Whole, of it? Just a better picture of it. Oh, okay, yeah. This this whole uh, enclosure rolls over and forms a kind of a hermetic seal around the shuttle, so that you can open the cargo bay doors which, by the way, can't support their own weight in 1G, so you have to put an external strong back on them. And in the meantime, you, uh, you put the, what, the payload that's going to be installed has been, you have a, this payload canister here, that's installed in the change-out room, and then it's swung over, the doors are open, the payload is installed in the bay, and then this forms a protective enclosure over the shuttle, and it's not swung back usually until the day before launch. So that's, uh, See now, this is again another detail in systems engineering. You went from that schematic or that that uh, little uh, plan form of the arbiter, and and you did iterations of the size, and then you had to do iterations of uh, the the launch complex, how it was going to be put payloads in, and that's all systems engineering. That uh, in certain certain uh, levels of systems engineering. Uh, I mean, it's very easy to say, well, we'll just we'll put the payload in on the pad, yeah. uh, but the actual development of the mechanisms to do that is is extremely complicated to say nothing of which I mean what kind of amazes me is is that it has to be done essentially in, in a clean room environment right. so you know you're up there crawling around the pad and inside the payload changeout room in, in you know white coats bunny suits and gloves on uh, and outside the wind is blowing and, the, and there, it could be raining there's sand blowing by and the, so the whole thing has to be done in a clean room environment but it's on the scale of a naval shipyard yeah. you know these, this is a huge vehicle so it, it's really a challenge of course and that's one of the reasons in all honesty that's one of the reasons in all honesty why the cost per flight has gone up you know the original concept 
When I when Dale Myers was associate administrator of manned space flight, man spoke to you, I went up to him and I was the orbital project manager. And we concluded this is gonna be very simple. We were gonna make very standard payloads. You you went and put the payload in, fixed it in, we were gonna launch it, de deploy it, come back if the computer failed the computer on the on the pad, we'd go anyways, we wouldn't replace the computer. Of course that all changed. The missions became very complicated, uh, and we did we didn't do that. So that is one thing. That's another important point though. You better be sure when you when you get to be a a project manager or manager, understand your requirements, understand your customer's need. But the ground, rule ch ground rules change, the, your, your performance is going to change. So you need to understand that. Any other points you want to make, Jeff? Any other question? I just got some other pictures that uh, show you. Here's the liftoff. As you see, liftoff, everything burning. Nice birds out of the way. I guess, we, have we ever had a, a case where we had a bird on launch? Uh, yes, I believe we have. Um, of course, one of the things you do in the orbital windows, yeah. uh, one of the things you do is you fire, you, I said, you fire dead chickens into the, the window to see if you can break the window in the, in the, in the system. I think you do an aircraft also. Yeah, and, 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 and we actually did, I remember one simulation where the, um, the, in, in the simulator, right at liftoff, the instructor came in and, and threw a rubber bird in the commander's lap and said, you've just been incapacitated by a bird strike. <laughs> and so the, the co-pilot had to take over the, uh, the flying. So um, you, you should realize the Kennedy Space Center is actually a wildlife sanctuary. Sure, yeah, and, and so there's, there's a lot of, uh, of, of birds. There. It's a na you know, there's, a, there's a national wildlife sanctuary, park rangers, and a lot of eagles, and uh, yeah, there's there's eagles in, in the nest. There's a lot of turkey buzzards, and um, before there's a there's a landing strip that's right in the middle of the bird sanctuary, and and so often before the shuttle gets ready to come in, they'll they'll send uh, planes to sort of buzz the runway uh, and scare the birds away. They also had a problem at one point with owls, no, woodpeckers, excuse me. Woodpeckers were decided that, that the external tank insulation was, was a good place to find bugs. And, and so they had, they, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it sounds funny, but, but think of what that actually potentially could mean. And they actually, they, you know, they had to go down and they, they, they had loudspeakers and, and stuffed owls and everything, which they ended up putting around to scare away. Away the woodpecker. So there's, there's, you know, these are things again which I think the original systems engineering never, never took into account. <laughs> We're worried about F equal ma. Um, and there's a typical deployment of, I believe that's a PAM, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Typical uh, in a payload assist module to get the shuttle uh, payload into orbit. Here's a picture of the crew at their, uh, at their station with their uh, CRTs. And of course, then you deorbit and enter. This is a this is of course not a real picture, but that's do I have that right? That's right. And um, then of course landing on the landing on the runway. So that's a typical profile that uh, we've gone through in terms of showing. Now let me talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, uh, systems engineering. Uh, when I took over in August of 72, uh, we had what we called Space Shuttle Orbiter Management Reviews. That's North American. And this was one of September 1972. And I think it might be interesting to look at the agenda in September of 1972, what we were talking about. And here was the agenda. I'm not going to go through all the paperwork, but here was the agenda. Uh, basic resizing of the vehicle because of certain problems we had in the iteration. Uh, cabin configuration and docking location. The space shuttle main engine interface control document. Turns out interface control documents are probably one of the most important systems integration tool because the interface control document defines how you're going to put the main engine into the orbiter. What is an interface? An interface could be how this plug, you know, if you got a plug in the socket, it would be bad if you couldn't plug that in. But that's an interface. When you change your tire, if those bolt hole patterns don't match, you'd be very frustrated. So that's an interface. So interfaces can be as simple as that, or they can be very, very complicated. So this is the SSME interface control document, how we actually get the main engine in terms of mechanical uh, propulsion uh, put into the orbit, into the orbiter. Integrated asset control, abort requirements. 
And now we're talking about just procurement. RCS and Ohm's procurement. Service, uh, uh, the Rocket Motors procurement package. Avionics definition, leading edge TPS, and emergency egress. So, so these were some of the problems we started talking about. Now these are lower level systems engineering problems, but they are systems engineering to make the definition of the, uh, of the uh, total, uh, uh, total launch configuration. Here's an interesting chart. This is dollars. And why this is interesting is that you see on this chart uh, the proposal, Rockwell's proposal. These are a million dollars, uh, $123 million the first year. But when I came over to project manager, that was Rockwell's proposal. The first thing they did to me, they told me I only had $73 million that year. So I had to rephase the whole program. I had to rephase the whole program to fit the, the funding curve that the Office of Management Budget gave, gave, uh, gave me. So this was a major perturbation. When you do that, when you do that and you don't get your, your money as the proposal, it turns out to be a cost increase. Right away, we went a little bit cost increase to 4.6, but as, it, as you don't get the funding requirements, you then essentially lose your momentum, you lose your, your schedule, and once you lose schedule, you, lose, you, you start costing. As, as Dr. Hoffman mentioned, you have the three-legged stool of cost, schedule, and performance, and that is a continual trade-off. Continual trade-off as you go through a systems engineering program. And uh, the things you have to look at, the things that cause program managers, project managers to lose their job is first you're going to recognize that you have a weight increase in the vehicle. Whatever you build is going to cause to have your weight increase. The next thing you're going to have is a schedule slip. And then when you put those together, you're going to have a cost increase. And then you're going to have technical problems. And those are, those are uh, disastrous cases for a project manager. Those are the reasons to fire somebody. Uh, luckily, I made it. I made it because of a man that you're going to hear talk, Chris Kraft, because he was my boss, my immediate boss. And he ran interference for me. And you're going to hear Dr. Kraft talk. And he's a good man to have on your side and run interference for you. So you're going to hear him talk. He's a, he's a great guy, and he's, he's going to tell you what he thinks. And he'll tell you what he thinks. But that's, that's a little bit about cost. Uh, further, further, uh, further systems engineering questions in the orbital management review is uh, orbital maximum wing size at ATP is our authority to proceed. Wing size is very important. You got to get that model, the aerodynamic model, the wing loads squared away. Uh, we said no major line change after program requirements review. Controlled rye weight was 170,000 pounds, <laughs> including margin. And I don't think we made that. Did no, we didn't. No, no, no we didn't. <laughs> or like 200,000. Yeah. Uh, no ejection seats on vertical flights. Top located uh, docking port. Wing area for landing speeds of 150 knots. Wing stiffness criteria, flutter margins, control effectiveness for entry and ferry, elevon design concepts, and integral cantilevered crew cabin. These were some of the systems engineering problems that had to be resolved before you could start manufacturing. One of the interesting things, I, I forgot who was head of the, crew, of the astronaut office at the time, but I don't know if it was Brandon Stein, I don't know who it was. Anyways. For, for, at which time? Well, about the time of the design of the shuttle. About this time, well, well, it was, Al Shepard was. was it, I forgot. I asked somebody. I when John Young took over. Yeah, I, I forgot who I asked, but we were trying to get the cockpit laid out. It was very important to get the cockpit laid out, and I wanted the crew to have their inputs and how they wanted the cockpit. You want the crew to be a part of laying out the cockpit. So I called the head of the astronaut office over, and I said, um, "We need to lay out this cockpit." And you need to come back to me with a decision of how you want the copy. He says, he said, I can't do it. I've got 100 astronauts over there, and they won't agree. I said, I'll tell you what you do. You tell them that I'll give them two weeks, and then I'm going to do it. And that really scared them, because I didn't know anything about laying out a cockpit, and we had the cockpit laid out. So that's, that's some types you have to use some type of manage, management techniques. Okay, now we're going to get more into the details of um, now we're going to get more into the details of what you're going to hear in some detail. I'm going to give you start it off a little bit. Uh, here are basically the hard, hardware subsystems. You're going to hear 
a technical briefing on the thermal protection system and the structures. Uh, you'll see in, the, in your syllabus when that is. But that's, you're going to hear a very detailed discussion of the, of the uh, thermal protection system and structures by, the, uh, by Tom Moser, who actually did the work. He was actually what I call my subsystem manager on the shuttle in the early days of the program. You're going to hear a, a technical briefing on the space shuttle main engines. A very detailed briefing by J.R. Thompson. J.R. Thompson, a little background about him. He was uh, head of the, he was project manager of the main engine at Marshall Space Flight Center. Then he became uh, director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. Then he was deputy administrator uh, at NASA. Now he's a he's work, he's a vice president of orbital sciences. You're going to have a, 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 a detailed briefing on the hydraulic system, the auxiliary power system, fuel cells, orbital maneuvering system, and the reaction control systems. That's going to be by Henry Pohl. Guidance navigation control is going to be by, Steve, uh, by Phil Haddis from the uh, Draper Laboratories. Environmental control and life support in the crew cabin, and that's going to be a man that's is currently working at the Johnson Space Center, Walt Guy, who actually who actually did this job for the Apollo. Most of these people, by the way, by the way, did the same thing for the shuttle, the Apollo that they did for shuttle. So uh, very similar job. So you can ask these people about the shuttle, about the uh, Apollo program. Uh, landing mechanical systems by Al Levere. Communications, electrical power, we're really not going to brief. Although we'll talk electrical power when we talk fuel cells, but we're not going to really have a discussion on, on communications and, and fuel cells. And then we're going to have some analytical studies. We're going to have analytical studies on aerodynamics and aerothermodynamics. These will probably be uh, probably if you have any more, t more these will probably be detailed technical discussions when we get an aer uh, aerodynamics and aerothermodynamics. And again, these people did the same uh, same on the shuttle as they did on Apollo as they did on shuttle. So that's going to be your details of the of what you're going to see. What I'd like to do now, with the few minutes we have remaining, is talk to you a little bit about. Uh, a little bit about, give you a little bit of flavor of some of these subsystems, a little bit more detail than that we've previously given you, but not as much detail as you're going to see. So let's start off a little bit with the Arbiter and just show you uh, what the Arbiter looks like. And uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the subsystems in the Arbiter. Uh, the forward reaction control system is up in the far uh, nose of the vehicle, and then you have the reaction control system back in what's called the, I guess I'm supposed to, the Ohm's pod, the orbital maneuver system pod. You have reaction control systems here and here. So that's the reaction control systems. You have your orbital maneuvering system back in these Ohm's pods. Of course, you have the main gear, we're going to, main landing gear and nose landing gear. Uh, the wing fairing and the leading edge which is the carbon material that got down this wing leading edge is carbon material and uh, the side hatch and uh, the overhead windows and then the side windows and the forward windows the payload bay the payload bay is an interesting payload bay doors are made out of graphite epoxy graphite epoxy is uh, originally made out of aluminum we made out of graphite epoxy because of the weight growth. We could save quite a bit of weight if we made them, if we went from aluminum to graphite epoxy. So that was the largest, probably at that time, it was the largest composite material used in an airplane. It was made out of graphite epoxy. And then the main engines, of course, are in the aft end of the orbiter. And uh, then you have the vertical tail, the stabilizer, and of course you got your uh, the, your, uh, your elevons. And you got the body flap. The body flap is, was actually put on originally to deflect some of the heat from the engine, but actually it turned out it turned out to be a control surface also. So it actually turned out to be both functions of a control surface. So that's sort of the layout, and you can visualize where you use these systems, these active systems. The reaction control system is used primarily in orbit and get get ready to deorbit. The ohms is used to help you get into orbit and get out of orbit or maneuvering you want to do. The uh, body flaps and the elevons are actually used 
primarily during entry, a little bit during ascent, during entry. Uh, we do use the RCS system a little bit during entry, in the high altitudes of entry is used in the, uh, use the, use the RCS system, but eventually during entry the loads come so high the RCS system, or reaction control system, does not become very effective. Um, I guess that's about all I want to say. Any questions on that? Okay. Yes, sir. I was wondering why the nose gear was so short. Well, it was, it's actually it uh, saved weight, but making it shorter, it was easier to put in and it saved weight, and it g gave you a. Yeah. And, and I think also uh, by when when you land, um, the by having the nose down, uh, you actually have an aerodynamic force pushing you down. the orbiter down on the runway, which which increases your stability. And since you don't have to worry about, you know, eventually taking Enough. off, like 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 Professor Cohen said, if if they had wanted the shuttle to be able to take off horizontally, for the runway, they, they would have had to raise the nose. Yes, sir. Can you pop under to try the little just to save the weight? Uh, well, when you say under designed, I mean it was it was I would call it a minimum design. If, if it was not, I mean, if it were under designed, it would it would break. I mean, there there are landing limits. Yeah, you know, as I limits. said, the, the the orbiter for for a planned nominal landing. And, and you have to realize there there are different kinds. There's emergency limits and, and limits for nominal operations. You can take off with 65,000 pounds. That means if you have a, a, a launch aboard and you have to return and land with your payload, you will be landing with 65,000 pounds in your... But, but you don't plan to do that. Um, that's a one-off deal. If you're planning to do it, it means you can do it over and over again, and then the limit is 35,000 pounds. They don't build it like a Navy carrier landing airplane, yeah. I'll tell you that. Not, not just many, I, I always found the tail was just really small. The tires are small. They, yeah. so they, have no for, for they, have no, they have no treads either. Yeah, and, and the brakes <laughs> were small. Actually, the brakes, the original brakes were under designed, yeah. and, and we kept having brake failures. And that's why we put, the, put the, In fact, I took the drag chutes off, and then we put them back on. Right. I, I, was, I took them off because of weight, and we put them back on. Uh, uh, tires are very interesting. We're going to have a very de detailed discussion on tires, but tires are very, are very, very complicated. You know, you think by putting more uh, treads on the tire, no, more, tre more plies on the tires, you make it stronger, but not necessarily because the si uh, when you cycle them, uh, they get hot, and the more uh, uh, more plies tend to hold the heat in, and it weakens the tire. So tires are, are not a very simple thing to design. It's used only once. Yeah. No, I think we use tires about we use tires about I think five times. I could use them. Five times the brakes are used five times. I don't know about the tires. The tires. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Let me uh, let me t you talk about weight and margin. Let me t go back to Apollo. Uh, we had Apollo designed, and uh, we found that on the lunar module, taking off from the lunar surface, uh, it was too heavy. We couldn't the, we couldn't lift off, and the engines were already built, the tanks were already sized, and we couldn't get off the lunar surface, and that's not a very good deal. Well, the astronauts didn't like that too well. So what we did is George Lowe was the uh, uh, program manager at the time. We were spending in those year dollars twenty four thousand dollars a pound to get weight out of the lunar module, and they did they they scraped they they sh they did everything they could to get any. That, that was a bonus to Grumman, is the way I heard. It. Well, is that correct? It was bonus you, to you were basically offering them twenty four thousand dollars for every pound, pound that they could scrub out because yeah. we had no way of getting off surface. We couldn't resize the engine. The engine was there. Yeah, they were literally in there with with emery cloth, <laughs> shaving down the aluminum from the the inside. So uh, yeah, so weight can be very critical. Yeah, I don't think most people realize how close the margins were there. I mean, the, yeah. the, the lunar module was only certified for, I think, what, five pressurizations? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Uh, and, and then it was yeah. beyond its structural my, my statement to many people, the next time we go to the moon, we're going to find out how hard it really was. <laughs> because, uh, to tell you the truth, we went to the moon, we went to the moon with one computer in the command module, and service module and one computer in the lunar module. Although, excuse me, we did have two computers in the lunar module. We did have two computers in the lunar module. We had a, we had the M I the MIT computer, uh, and then we had a strap down system built by TRW. So uh, that's an interesting point. Let me uh, 
Let me now, uh, I think somebody asked a question last time. Let me talk about the aft end of the orbiter a little bit because uh, we did not have CAD CAM systems at the time. We did not have CAD CAD systems. And let me show you a little bit. These are some pictures. These are some pictures taken. Um, this is, uh, I don't know what vehicle is, but that's the aft end of the orbiter going together. That's where the big engines go into. Uh, had we, this is like some take off. Um, this, if you crawled in the back of the aft end of the orbiter, there's plumbing, there's wiring, there's structure. Now, had we had computer aided design at that time, I'm convinced we would have a much neater, better design than we have today. We had to mock everything up. We mocked it up and we changed it. People bumped their heads on it. And But this this is really, you go back in the afternoon article, you wonder how they can do anything with it. But that was done because we did not have computer aid design. We couldn't build like the, the you know, like, the, like airplanes now have virtual mock-ups. You know, you can actually build a virtual mock-up right on, the, on your computer. We didn't have any of that. And this again is just to show you the uh, just what the for, uh, crew module looks like in a in a structural point of view. Uh, that that has to be that was the pressure vessel. That's basically a pressure vessel going together, and there were the windows and and the, but the thing that's interesting about that it had very intricate welding techniques, and uh, these techniques were very good and actually they proved to be a very very satisfactory design in a pressure vessel. I would like to now talk a little bit about a couple of subsystems that you're going to hear much more detail about, but now venture into some subsystems and tell you a little bit about them. It's probably going to be the, uh, the thermal protection system and the guidance and navigation system. Talk to you a little bit about that. Here is a chart. This is an old chart that shows, now unfortunately I use English units. Maximum heat rate in BTUs per foot second squared, integrated heat load, and radiative equilibrium temperature. And that is, and then you see the the uh, Apollo return is, is number four. And the Apollo design was about um, 100 BTUs per foot squared, integrated heat load, if I read the chart right, and about 300 BTUs, oh, excuse me, yes, and about a heat flux of about uh, 300 BTUs per foot squared second with a radiative equilibrium temperature of about a little over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the arbiter, now we used on, the, on Apollo, that was our, our baseline, we used a, radi uh, a blade of uh, heat shield. Now the blade of heat shield has a, a density of about 130 to 140 pounds per cubic foot. Now, and it's not reusable. On the, on the uh, shuttle, um, shuttle was about uh, 40,000 BTUs per foot squared integrated heat load and 50 BTUs per foot squ uh, squared second for heat flux with the radiative equilibrium temperature of about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we had to, we had to, at that point in time, we had to come down from our, ba our baseline knowledge of uh, an ablative material to what we could use and make it reusable. And light. And light, and light, light. And there were several, there were several uh, competitors at the time. One was a, a metal uh, insulation, Rene, or, or, uh, Rene, I believe, 41, shingle type material, very thin, make it very thin, very high temperature, uh, and it had pretty low density. And then, of course, there was the uh, ceramic material, or the so-called tiles, which was basically a ceramic material. It's made out of uh, silica. In fact, interesting enough, it's made out of what we call gopher sand that comes from Minnesota. Uh, why is it gopher sand? I'm not quite sure, but it's got a very high pure silica content. And you make it into a mulch, and then you actually bake it, and it comes out in these blocks, tiles. And of course, tiles sometimes are hard to bond to the vehicle. I mean, how many people knew that tiles were hard to stay on the vehicle? Well, I was the uh, Arbiter Project Manager, and uh, my hometown is San Antonio, Texas. So we'd go back to San Antonio to visit my family. My little aunts would say, you know, their nephew is in charge of the shuttle program. 
and he was having trouble making the tiles stay on, stay on the vehicle. They couldn't understand it because they had tiles in their kitchen and their bathroom and they had no trouble at all having those tiles stay on the vehicle. So they couldn't understand why I was having so much problem having the tiles stay on the vehicle. But So we had a problem, what would we use? And we came up and there was two com uh, competitions on it. One was uh, the competition from uh, two of the research centers. Uh, the Langley Research Center wanted to go with the metallic version and the Ames Research Center wanted to go with the ceramic version. And uh, we at JSC were, were trying to figure out which one to go with, and we decided to go with the uh, ceramic version. Of course, Tom Moser is going to go this in detail because Tom, uh, when you, we hear Tom talk, because he was the guy really in charge of it. But just to give you a little background, and he'll go into more details of it, but just to give you a little background of it, um, um, the problem we had with the tiles. The problem we had with the tiles is that when you bonded the tiles, of course they were, they were ceramic. They were basically a ceramic material. And when you bonded the tiles, forget about this layer called densified for a moment. When you bonded the tiles to the uh, room temperature of vulcanizing material, which is basically a glue, high temperature glue, to the strain isolator pad, you got stress riser set up and the tile became very weak it broke really in the t uh, at the bond line of the tile because it came very weak. It broke the, the stress risers were such that because it was ceramic, it broke at the, at the uh, interface. We had one clever engineer, one very clever engineer, that saved my life, my day, because tiles were f falling off, and uh, you know I couldn't get the veal built. He said that if we densify. Lower, about a lower quarter of an inch of the tile. The tiles could be anywhere from, a, from two inches to four inches thick. If you densified the low quarter of an inch, by that I mean put liquid glass inside that tile. The, the, the bottom became like a, 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 a really hard surface, no stress riser. You could bond it like this and basically have the stre inherent strength of the tile. It no longer broke at the bond line, it broke at the tile which had a very high, which had a very high load. So we really did, so after we did that, we really did solve the tile problem to a large extent. So that was, that was the day that, that we really solved the tile problem. But it was so, I, I, I remember this so distinctly that we were doing all these tests and all these analyses and all of a sudden they called me one day and said, Aaron, we're just doing a very simple flat wise tension t test and tiles are just coming off like, just like everything off the vehicle. So that is what um, saved the day. In, in the I think it's, it's a good, uh, another good example of problems in system engineering. If you just leave it there for a moment. Sure, because, sure. You know, we worked so hard figuring out how to make these tiles. I mean, well, and, and they're extraordinary. You can take one of these tiles, you put it in, in put one side of it in, into a, a, a kiln, heat it red hot, and, and you could hold the other side of it in your fingers. I mean, that's that's how good the insulation is. And I guess everybody just sort of figured, well, well we you, know how to glue you, things you, on. You, you, you know, brought, up, things on you brought up a very uh, another very good point that I left out. The, the problem is we spent so much time, so much time figuring out the efficiency of the tiles to do the thermal protection. In other words, this is fantastic uh, tile. It weighs, it's about the density of, uh, it weighs about like balsa wood. It's like balsa wood. So it's anywhere from 10 to 12 pounds per cubic foot compared to 130 pounds per cubic foot. It can take a higher temperature as a blade of material and be reused. So it answered all the questions we had about thermal protection. What we didn't do, though, is figure out how we we're going to attach it to the vehicle. And Everybody, and, I think, just assumed. Oh, we, you know, well, it, I mean, it's almost well, like, like your relatives. You know, we, we glue tiles <laughs> on the bathroom yeah. all the time. You know, anybody well, can glue yeah. stuff on. But we, we really did a bad job. In fact, yeah. that's, that's an example I use in my course at A&M, is we, we come up with a function structure. What functions does this have to perform? Well, it doesn't actually have to thermally protect the vehicle. It's got to stay on. And we forgot about the staying on part. We, uh, we, we talked about the thermal protection part. And we, this thing is so good, it's uh, thermal diffusivity is so good that I mean, like uh, Professor Hoffman said, you could get the surface temperature to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit and hold the palm of your hand. And uh, so it turned out it was a very, very good solution, but we almost blew the day by not coming up with this design. 
Why does it have to be individual tiles well, rather than big long panels? Well, because of the coefficient, difference coefficient expansion. Um, now, and that's that's the point of this strain isolation peg. And, and it's another interface problem, which is part of the systems engineering. The structure of the shuttle is aluminum. Okay. It, it thermally it expands and contracts by several inches every time you go from night to day. I mean the orbiter, it, they, we've done these measurements. I mean the or, one side of the orbiter is pointed towards the sun, the other gets, the side is cold. And the orbiter actually bananas by by a couple of degrees, and and they they did thermal tests in some of the orbital flight tests where, you know the 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 payload bay, uh, the, the clearances could change by a couple of inches depending on the thermal conditions and designing mechanisms to latch them closed with, with those tolerances. So the, the orbiter is flexible and it, it expands and contracts as a metal. The tiles don't. They're, they're rigid. And, and so if you have too large a tile area, you know, the, the aluminum is going to bend under it and the tiles will, will crack. And even with the small tiles, between the aluminum and the tile, there's this strain isolation pad, which is like, think of it as sort of like a felt type material. So it, it kind of eases the interface uh, between the two. Of course, then if you look at uh, if you look at the tile ins installation on the vehicle, and, that, and that's in, in between the tiles. You remember on the last mission we went EVA to uh, to fix the gap filters, but gap filters between each one of those tiles mainly for problems during liftoff to keep the tiles from vibrating and damaging each other. And those uh, gap fillers, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I had my concern about going EVA to fix it, but on the other hand, once you see the problem, you can't let it go, so you got to do something about it. So they went EVA and, and pulled the gap fillers out. But those are the tile installations. Mm -hmm. But your questions are very pertinent. When why there's so many, and that's the reason is because of the coefficient expansion. Then you put gap fillers in between those tiles to keep it from uh, damaging during liftoff. It turns out, though, it does turn out that one of our biggest concerns was going to be the the. Uh, the, uh, the, how fragile the tiles were, and it turns out they really aren't that. They, they really turn out to be a pretty good system. They really turn, we were concerned about losing a tile and then getting heat and having an unzippering effect where you lose a bunch of tiles, and uh, we really, uh, uh, you know, we really uh, uh, alleviated the problem. I'll tell you another funny story, and then I guess we can quit. Um, this is probably not so funny, but it uh, it was a story anyway. So um, I forgot what mission it was. But um, what these tiles are, they are actually waterproof. We actually put Scotch Guard on them because the waterproofing is in the tile, and after a certain mission, the waterproofing boils out. So we had to waterproof the tile. STS-4 was the hailstorm. Well, I don't know. That, was, that was, was the first one where they where they recognized the problem. Well, well, anyways, Rockwell International. It was my contractor, Rockwell International. The head engineer at Rockwell was a brilliant guy, but uh, he ran a test where he put a tile panel, densified tile panel, in a bucket of this um, Scotch Guard, or this uh, rain uh, repellent material. And he called me about 11 o'clock at night. And I was getting ready to go in because we're getting ready to retro uh, fire and land. He said, Aaron, we just ran this test, and all the tiles came off. I said, what do you want me to do with that information? We're getting ready to make the deorbit burn. I mean, you know, they were coming down. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I, I said, that was sort of a dumb test, wasn't it? I said, is that what happened on the vehicle? Did you actually put a bucket of the tiles in a bucket of, of, of water, water repellent material? He said, no. I said, well, why? that's a dumb test. I took it upon myself, after talking to the man you're going to hear, Tom Moser, what do we do with it? And we didn't tell anybody. Now, that I took a big risk on that, but uh, it, what, what could you do about it? There was absolutely nothing you could do about it uh, on that test. So that is a, an interesting case. And, uh, discretionary project management. But you'll hear more. Let me just mention the, the question of waterproofing because, again, that was something that, we that I think at first slipped through See, the, the systems through. engineering. Yeah. And it was it was the fourth shuttle flight, STS-4. I was, I was down at the Cape for, for some other activity. The night before launch, they had they had rolled back the payload change-out room. The whole shuttle was exposed. Well, a thunderstorm with hail came through, and, and it be, it pelted the yeah, the, right. the bottom of, of the shuttle. There were pock marks all over it, and of course, it was raining. And people realized that that the tiles um, actually were absorbing 
material. The, the outside of the tile uh, is kind of impervious, but once you crack that, the, the rain can get in. And, and they actually, they, they brought a tile expert down from the Cape, and they, they did some calculations, and they, how much water, I mean, we, I think we ended up carrying, it was, it was a, an early flight, so, so we weren't, we didn't have a maximum payload, luckily, because we ended up carrying, they figured, a few, uh, probably a, f a few hundred, maybe over a thousand pounds of water into orbit and there was so much water in the tiles that the orbital dynamicists were able to measure the perturbation of the shuttle's orbit because of all the water that was evaporating and of course it was evaporating from the bottom so that it effectively was asymmetrical and had a propulsive force and after that was when they when they came up with the idea of scotch guarding and if you look closely at each of the tiles there's a little hole where they every tile before every flight they go through with a with a hyper dermic syringe and they just inject a little bit of of uh, scotch guard and and you know you think how critical it is you've got over 30,000 tiles if you add one ounce to every tile you do the math that's a lot of extra weight so you want to put in as little possible scotch guard but enough to do the job you know, the reason why you bring up this sub this might be a very good uh, subject for you to, to decide to redesign you might think about what are the technologies what are the uh, differences how would you do it differently because their technology has changed and you might uh, that's why I brought this one up and you'll hear much more detailed discussion by Tom Moser but you might think about this as a is one of the subsystems to look at I guess that's all for today okay we'll see you on Thursday